welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I have a huge episode. We've got Jill Cook and Ebony Rio on, and Jill Cook is a professor of musculoskeletal health at La Trobe University. Jill's research areas include sports medicine and tendon injury, and after completing a PhD in 2000, she has investigated tendon pathology treatment options and risk factors for tendon injury. And Ebony Rio is a researcher at La Trobe University and has completed a PhD in tendon pain. Ebony has a master's in sports physio and during her career, she has worked at the Institute of Sport, Australian Ballet Company, Melbourne Heart Football Club and many more professional sporting teams. A huge welcome to Jill and Ebony. Thank you for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Looking forward to it. So I about, about a, four weeks ago, I had Peter Maliaris on. So be interesting to see whether there's any differences. There's always going to be some differences in each clinician in terms of their approach, but um, we talked about tendons, so we'll see what you have both got to say. Look forward to it. All right, first thing, let's start with the yes, no, or maybe questions. Good luck. Are we ready? Is there I'll a prize? Ask, <laughs> there might be. There might be a prize. Uh, each question I'll ask, and then I'll go Jill, then Ebony, and yes, no, or maybe. Yeah, first one. In regards to a tendinopathy, can the tendon pathology heal? Jill? No. Ebony? No. Is tendonitis a poor word to describe a tendinopathy? Jill? Yes. Yes. Ebony? Yes. Two yeses. <laughs> Would you typically see patella tendinopathy in a middle aged woman? Jill? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are knee extensions a great exercise for patella tendinopathy? Yes. Yes. If you have a diagnosed tendinopathy and you've seen a clinician and you have not been given a structured heavy slow resistance program, should you see someone else? Yes. <laughs> yes. Should everyone do plyometrics for lower limb tendinopathies? No. No. Not everyone. Is patella tendinopathy overdiagnosed and the diagnosis is often patellofemoral pain? Yes. Yes. Should your rehab program be different for an Achilles peritendon issue versus an Achilles mid-portion tendinopathy? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> we'll dive into that one for sure. <laughs> Do you have to be an athlete that jumps regularly to get patella tendinopathy? Yes. Definitely. Is PRP an effective treatment for tendinopathy? No. No. Will patella tendinopathy clients usually have calf weakness on the affected side? Yes. Yes. Done. Oh, I thought we'd have more maybes, but they'll be so quiet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I let you off the hook. Does. I let you off the hook there. I could have made them a few, a few of them a little bit harder, but yes, no, or maybe you nailed it. Easy. Did we pass? <laughs> Absolutely passed. Well done. Now let's dive into it. First one. So the tendon pathology healing, Jill, let's just dive into that. You said no. Basically, if we're talking about degenerative tendon pathology, which is the one that we see clinically most, then the answer is definitely no, because there is no structure in the tendon matrix. You have abnormal cells. And it is not load sensitive tissue and tendons need load to be able to structure a matrix and they need normal cells to structure a matrix. Therefore, it's a vicious circle. If it's not, doesn't have structure, it's not load sensitive, therefore it can't form structure. And it really doesn't matter what guru medicine you use, it is not going to heal, repair, normalize, whatever you want to say. Reactive tendon, which we don't see very much of, is a different kettle of fish and perhaps I could leave that to Ebony to comment. Um, no, that's okay. You finish on the structure because then I was going to add something else. So keep I going. No, I finished. Oh, I was going to say it's also not an outcome that we're interested in, Andrew. And so we're not looking to change the pathology. Um, we know that we can get re really good improvements in pain and function, which is what we're after. So even though the pathology doesn't change in the degenerative area it's not a barrier to improvement and i'll supplement that by saying sean docking's work on how much structure there is in a degenerative tendon shows that 
most tendons that have a degenerative area actually have plenty of good normal tissue. So it's almost as though you can ignore the area of degeneration and focus on um, improving the capacity of the normal part of the tendon. Do you, use, do you both use the concept of the donut, not the hole? Yes. Yep. So it's clinically something you use. Yep. It's really important for patients. Mm. They come in with all sorts of um, uh, ideas from their radiology reports, from their GPs, from what's on the internet, that they have a degenerative tendon that it might tear and better not load. So you have to undo those things before you can actually get them to load. And, you know, I note that all of this biopsychosocial stuff is, you know, in, in tendon, tendinopathy now, but, you know, it's been happening for a long time. It, it's about educating these people. And this donut and the whole thing is so important. You have plenty of good tissue. There's no reason for you to be frightened of loading. And if you then structure their program so it's a progressive load, they learn um, very quickly that the tendon is happy they can load. Now, you mentioned scanning or MRI. A lot of my clients come in and they bring me an MRI. They're saying, oh, I've got a tendinopathy or I've got this on MRI. Ebony, would you just dive into why often people have pathology but no pain and vice versa? Yeah, so um, critically, what we know in musculoskeletal uh, tissues is that we see lots of changes and we see them in people with and without pain. So imaging is not diagnostic, not for um, tendinopathy, but not for most of our musculoskeletal pain conditions. Um, we see more changes in tendon the more you've loaded. So Kevin Liebethal did some great work a few years ago in people with no Achilles pain that were runners. And he found that essentially you were more likely to have changes in your tendon if you'd been running for longer than seven years. So it's a load related change rather than being diagnostic. Um, we recently did a consensus process and agreed with a lot of international experts that imaging is not required to make a diagnosis. And clinically, it's really misleading because a lot of people will have pathology. A lot more people will have pathology than what will have the condition. Jill, you got anything to add there? No, not really. But where it does help, Andrew, is it's unlikely you have tendinopathy if you have a completely pristine tendon on imaging. That's a really good point. So I, negative imaging is more helpful. Yeah. Yep. And I, I am currently dealing with a little bit of patella tendinopathy on my left side, but as a bit of an experiment, what I did is I actually went and had an MRI in both of my knees and it came up with a little bit of patella tendon or tendinopathy on both sides, but my left tendon was, is the symptomatic side and it makes complete sense. I was a high jumper and I played Aussie rules and I jumped off my left. Makes complete so sense. Yeah, can we can we just expand? Ebony talked that tendons are about load accumulation over life. So as you get older, you're more likely to have pathology. If you do more, you're more likely to have pathology. The patella tendon is actually quite different. So we're in the process of confirming some research that we've done pilot work for is that patella tendon pathology develops in adolescence in tall, often in tall jumping men. And it's about a maturation disease. So if you are trying to attach your tendon to the patella, and that happens in the one to two years post-peak height velocity, so for, for boys 15, 16 sometimes, um, girls perhaps a little bit earlier, if you do excess jumping in that time, you can disrupt that attachment and you form a pathology, and then you carry that with you in life. So it's actually quite different from the Achilles, which is a true load accumulation disease. Um, glutes, load accumulation, hamstring tendons, load accumulation. So it's actually quite different. Got anything to add there, Ebony? Just, yeah, but it's still load, but at that critical time, I guess, is the point. So your MRIs would have looked like that for a long time. Exactly. And that's where we can yeah. get into trouble with imaging is we image you as a, I'm not going to guess your age, but um, if we image you now, it's a mistake to say that that, you know, is, is diagnostic. They've been there a long time. And as you pointed out, um, the same changes on the other side. A, a good analogy I find is with some people that come in with a patella tendinopathy that's really spiked in their mid-20s because they've gone back to sport or something is much like a volcano. 
like it's been dormant for a very long time and potentially the tendon pathology was accumulated throughout their adolescence. And then finally the increase in jumping load during their twenties, if they've gone back to sport that involves a lot of jumping has been the thing that's actually spiked it. Would you agree with that in terms of analogy? Yes, I think in the for every other tendon, absolutely, it's about changing load. So if you've not done enough jumping and then you go back to jumping, it's a massive change in load. Therefore, you are vulnerable to onset of symptoms because your capacity in your tendon, your, your function isn't good enough for you to do that. The caveat on that for the patella tendon is it's also a completely perfect scenario for patella femoral pain and that you have to be so careful that you are actually looking at a patella tendinopathy. And, you know, we, we tend to find that once you're 30, and I'm not suggesting that's your age, um, I'm you don't see, <laughs> we don't see much patella tendinopathy after the age of 30. Um, we see a lot more, sorry, patella tendinopathy after the age of 30. We see a lot more patella femoral pain. Ebony, anything? No, I agree. Now, in regards to the differences between patella tendon pain and your patella femoral type of uh, syndrome or pain or whatever you want to call it, what are the differences and what type of symptoms and clinical presentation will you have if you have patella tendinopathy? Ebony. So it's critical that people take a really good history because there's so many similarities so actually the devil's in the detail so if you play basketball it is a huge amount of patellofemoral compression as well as jumping you know they, they spend a lot of time in that squat position they can dive on their knees same with volleyball so even in a jumping athlete it's not a foregone conclusion that it's jumper's knee or patella tendinopathy so the first thing is understanding tendon load and understand what is high tendon load for that tendon. So for the patella tendon, that's our jumping. It's also our fast lunging change of direction. But again, both of those can provoke the patellofemoral joint. So you need to go further and find out if low tendon load is provocative. So do they have pain when they run in a straight line? Not tendinopathy, but it can provoke the patellofemoral joint. Do they have pain on the bike? Not tendinopathy, but it can provoke the patellofemoral joint. A lot of our clinical tests will provoke each of those conditions. So a really important question becomes where their pain is. Patella tendinopathy is really focal at the inferior pole and it doesn't move or spread. And we're talking about that focal pain under high tendon low conditions, not with palpation, because it can be very sensitive in patellofemoral pain to just poke the tendon. It can be a really sensitive region. So we're looking at localised pain with high tendon load. But the third thing that I think um, is often forgotten is tendon pain behaviour. Tendons have a classic um, warm-up phenomenon only to be worse the next day. And in other conditions, we can see a much more variable relationship with load. Patellofemoral pain can hurt a lot more that night um, and they can be fine the next day. So it's really just putting together the whole story. From an objective perspective, um, we do see differences in the way they hop. People with patella tendinopathy hop with a really stiff knee. So clinically, as soon as we're seeing someone that's getting into a lot of knee bend, particularly with valgus, it really points towards the patellofemoral joint. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we, we see two differences in muscle wasting. You tend to lose muscle very quickly in a tendinopathy and much, much less in patellofemoral pain. So we see a lot of frank quad and calf wasting in patella tendinopathy. And with the patellofemoral joint, you're sort of thinking, oh, maybe the quads is a bit down and, you know, we've really lost BMO, which is fabulous. Um, they, they don't tend to be quite so overtly, um, have such overt muscle wasting. The second thing is um, on the decline squat, it's a very different story. Um, if you decline squat somebody with patella tendinopathy, they'll go straight to six, seven, eight out of 10 pain in about the first 20 degrees. Someone with patella femoral pain will get to 40 or 50 degrees and have three or four out of 10 pain and it becomes more localized, less localized, whereas our patella tendons, boom, straight in early localized whereas patellofemoral pain is a very different story um, and, and of course as Emma said we see you know the kinetic chain changes above the tendon in patellofemoral pain 
in tendinopathy, we see the changes at the muscle tendon unit and below. So we see a lot of hip dysfunction in people with patellofemoral pain, much, much less in people with patellotendinopathy. Yeah, really well answered. Now, in terms of plyometrics, you both said that people don't need to do plyometrics. Not all people need to do plyometrics for a lower limb tendinopathy. Why is that the case? Because I think a lot of people think that you should just make sure everyone's doing plyos, no matter whether it's the patella or the Achilles, no matter their age. Jill, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, let's have a recipe, why don't we? I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is where we go wrong so much. So... You know, it's really obvious if you're progressively loading someone and taking their function and capacity up to a level that you then need to maintain that level to maintain that function. So if you get somebody hopping and jumping and changing direction, if you go back to being, a, you know, someone who walks their dog or plays golf, then you're never going to maintain that capacity. So there's two things. Why are we rehabbing somebody who isn't using their tendon in a plyometric way to do plyometrics aside from making their rehab longer and actually potentially provoking them when they go back to their normal life they're never going to be doing that anyway so there's no point in taking an older lady with glute med tendinopathy to hopping and jumping because she just wants to walk she wants to be able to shop and go up and down stairs that's the function that you restore for her and that's sufficient um, obviously, if she's a master's athlete and a runner, of course you do it. So it's about required capacity. So no point taking people beyond their required capacity because you'll never keep it. Love it. Ebony? Agree. It's just really individual. So restore um, their function at whatever level their desired function is. And in regards to weighted plyometrics, I know these are big in the world of strength and conditioning. You see a lot of trap bar jumps, this type of stuff. What are your thoughts, Ebony? So um, Craig Purdom has put together some fantastic slides looking at uh, different activities. And as you add speed, you actually add substantial load to the tendon. So that's what's that's what's a challenge for tendon is anything that's fast. And so as soon as you are doing something quicker, the rate of loading that you're applying the tensile load it, it spikes dramatically. So going from something like a leg press into, um, you know, a vertical jump into a stop jump or a counter movement jump, the, the load through the tendon is massive. So you actually don't need, nor is it probably safe to be adding additional load aside from body weight. So we do heavy loads with external load, nice and slow. And then as soon as we're doing function or um, energy storage work, it's body weight only because that's a huge jump in load for the tendon anyway. Jill? Yeah, um, I think it's easy to say strength and conditioning, you know, add load to biometrics. And I think that's fine, but not in someone you're rehabbing with a tendinopathy and likely not in somebody who's got a history of tendinopathy because that'll blow them up for sure. I've always said to add load to plyometrics and plyometrics, let's define it. It's the speed, the rate of loading that Ebbs talks about, plus height or weight. Um, adding that sort of load to a kinetic chain to a, an affected tendon, I think you need a base of about 12 to 18 months of strength and plyometric work before you could even think about adding load. And for most of us who are treating people with tendinopathy, that's, that's beyond our remit. We rehab people, get them back to their sporting environment, and we often counsel them not to do plyometrics with weight until next season or the season after, um, where they've actually got a better capacity. But, you know, on the whole, you don't need it unless you're super elite to be able to do those sorts of exercises. And if you are if you are adding plyometrics into someone's program, there are a certain amount of plyometrics that you're typically going to give a client and also are there a certain amount of jumps per session that a client or a, an elite young basketballer should be doing while they're at training to prevent or reduce their risk or deal with a current tendinopathy ebony oh there's about 12 questions in there andrew <laughs> so um 
if we're going with prevention, the research would say that we have no idea how to prevent a tendinopathy. If we're going with first principles, we would say that tendons hate change. So reducing uh, change for people and keeping them doing some sort of load, not having a complete off season would be important, but also making sure people have the strength in their muscles as well. So they would be our two uh, best ways of attempting to prevent tendinopathy, particularly in those with a history. Um, if we're talking about people that we're rehabbing, again, it's whether or not we're talking about rehab or in season, and they're quite different as well. Jill, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I think um, in season is quite different because there's so much manipulation of load and, and what loads you add and what loads you take away are really important. Um, but if we're trying to get somebody through a rehab progress back into a training environment, two things we do. One, we make sure that clinically or in our rehab program, they have the capacity to deal with a certain number of jumping manoeuvres, if we're talking patella tendon. Um, and once we can show that they can do 30, 40, 50 jumps and not have a flare the next day, then we can think about transitioning them back into a training environment, but in a really controlled way. So if they can do 50 jumps before you say, go back to training, then you send them back to training doing 50 jumps and then you gradually increase that. So it's about progression. So your progression doesn't stop with your heavy, slow resistance. It's so important to count your plyometric loads on a tendon and to progressively increase that because if you rehab them, cut them loose, send them back to the coach, he does a two hour training You've done 800 jumps, I mean, exaggeration, maybe not for volleyball players, um, you know, they're going to fail because you've got them up to 50 jumps and then you send them back to training and they do 800 jumps. And that's, that's, not, that's not progressive. Yeah. yeah. Well answered. Uh, now, and can I just add one more thing? Yeah, go for it. And that's why it's so important to understand what's high tendon load because that's where our GPS and some of our other markers of um, – training intensity don't give it to us um you know if we're talking about the patella tendon the patella tendon doesn't really care how much you've run in a session but it cares how many times you've jumped and how many of those big lunging change of directions that you've done and and our uh our current methods of tracking that tend not to be very helpful yeah in regards to when you do a squat, obviously when you get into deeper ranges, your knees start to track over your toes. And I don't know whether you've seen online, there's a guy in the States, the knees over toes guy, that's doing a lot of work where he pushes people into deep ranges of knee flexion to try and help people with chronic knee issues. And one of the things that he does is a decline board squat for full deep knee flexion. Um, and the other thing that he promotes is a split squat where he's split squatting, where he's pushing his knee as far forwards as possible to get complete knee, fle knee flexion where his calf is effectively touching his um, hamstring. What are your thoughts on that? And should you be pushing your knee into deep ranges of knee flexion if you have a patella tendinopathy? Ebony. Oh, you started with me before. Go, Jill. No. <laughs> All right, I'm delighted to answer this because the first thing we do when we are trying to start some squatting type behaviours in people with patella tendinopathy is actually go the complete opposite. We keep the tibia vertical and we go backwards. And you can take somebody with acute patella tendon pain that cannot do a squat to save themselves and get them to squat sort of like in a Bulgarian or almost a wall squat and they're completely pain free. Um, and they can actually achieve that. So we, we would absolutely never start with a tibia forward into dorsiflexion type of squat. We would much prefer to go backwards. We can get good quad strength, good glute strength without actually um, irritating the patella tendon. Then you supplement that with a lot of soleus load because it's the soleus that controls the ankle when you go into a deep squat. And then you can put that together in a squatting type manoeuvre. But then people squat two-legged um, and that's just a complete waste of time. If you have a tendinopathy, you actually need to be single leg. Um, there's so many, so many more things we can do other than a standard squat. And I don't know, what is the point of going into deep knee flexion unless you're a weightlifter? Because it's the same as taking people back to plyometrics. 
if you don't do deep, deep knee flexion in your sport, what is the point of irritating your knee um, and doing that if, unless you're going to use it in your sport? You'd be much better off working in the range that they're going to use than actually pushing them into that sort of range. Yeah, I, I agree. I, we, we hate recipes. You know, I, I hate the concept that, that one thing is going to be perfect for everybody. Yeah, and he seems to be getting some really good results, but um, at the same time, sure does. and yeah. it, it, the concept is push the knee into positions that have previously annoyed it or pissed it off and get stronger in those positions. Then over time, you see adaptation. And I know it's a, like it's a progressed slow build and there are regressions and progressions but for someone that does have a patella tendinopathy it sounds like both of you are saying that going forward you shouldn't go down into deep ranges of knee flexion you don't need to how does he know that's the range that's <laughs> created the problem yeah. i mean that's an assumption to start with if you have a sport where you where you use a big range of knee flexion such as weightlifting or if you are one of these basketball players that that play D really deep, you know, there are people who drop into B, then yes, okay, let's look at that as an option. But for the Joe average, they, they don't need it. And what's the point of strengthening in a range you're not going to use because you're not going to keep it. And, you know, when you go back, I, I and, you know, I just think I'm thinking about the load on the knee joint itself in those ranges and the patellofemoral joint load in those deep knee ranges. Why are we going there unless we have a very good reason to go there? Yeah, and it's, it sounds like you're both proponents of knee extensions. And I, I really, it frustrates me the fact that online and a lot of other clinicians I know don't like knee extensions for no reason. Um, why do you both love knee extensions for patella tendinopathy, but also for patella femoral pain um, clients? Because we're a big fan of addressing the deficits. And once you address the deficits and you're very fussy and you isolate it out, then you can put it together. If you have someone with a substantial quadricep um, muscle wasting and you give them a double leg multi-joint exercise, you're actually never going to address it. So um, I think it's about being a thoughtful clinician and building your evidence. So the double... Um, Heavy slow resistance is fantastic as a concept, but we don't use a double leg program because Jamie Gator's fantastic work, and we would all see it clinically, shows us that we have people with asymmetry. And so the best way to address asymmetry from a muscular perspective, and I won't even get into the brain, is to do a unilateral exercise. But even more than just a unilateral exercise, if you do a very isolated quadricep exercise, and the great thing about a leg extension is you can't not use your quad. It's not about thinking about VMO or turning something on or activating anything. If you move that bar, you can't not use your quad. And so it is an excellent way of addressing the quadricep deficit that we see. Similarly, we would also give a very isolated um, standing calf and seated calf exercise as well to address below the tendon. Jill? Yes, can I add to that? So one of the things that we want to restore as part of our rehab is the tendon stiffness. So a stiffer tendon mechanically can store more energy and is has a higher capacity for load and better can tolerate rate of loading better. The two things that restore mechanical stiffness are heavy slow resistance and isometrics. So we need to be putting both of those loads through the muscle tendon unit to address that lack of stiffness that we see in people who've been unloaded for a long period of time. And you can't do that in a multi-joint um, way or you can do it in a, you know, a way where you're not getting the maximum uh, load on the tendon to improve that mechanical stiffness. Are you typically going to be doing your compound and potentially plyometrics before you compound movements such as say a Bulgarian split squat or a split squat or something like that prior to doing your knee extensions later in the session if it's a heavy slow resistance or the other way around? I know that's a hard question to answer because it might differ from person to person. Yeah, look, uh, it completely depends on the person. And sometimes just access to equipment. You know, sometimes yeah. we can't get the equipment that we want that person to use. So your your program can't decide 
a priori how you're going to approach this. It's about the person, you know, we, you know, our sort of loading capacity sort of um, editorial. What is the person able to do now? What do they need to do? How am I going to get from what they have to what they need to do? And then what, what facilities do I have? How many times can this person get to the gym? All of those things impact on your decisions. And sometimes um, we can get the perfect program and sometimes we can't. But I would never say A before B or B before A. Uh, you know, it's, it's exactly what we, we're counselling against in, in, yeah. in this profession about having rules and regulations around what you do. And, you know, the Twitterati, uh, you know, oh, well, just load it and everything's going to be fine. Well, we've never said that. And it annoys me that people think that that's how we should be, you know, how we um, say that you should approach a tendinopathy. It's, there's so many nuances in everything we do and so much biopsychosocial stuff in everything we do. And it's easy to sort of just distill it down to a simple thing. And that's what drives me mad, in case you hadn't heard about that. <laughs> Ebony? <laughs> no, I don't have anything more to add. Nothing. Yeah. I've even done a couple of experience on, experiences on myself, you know, changing where I put my knee extensions. And I found that the knee extensions prior to doing a heavier Bulgarian split squat makes it feel so much better. And I tried the other way around and I didn't like it as much. The, the tendon pain the next day was definitely worse if I went Bulgarians first. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. You need to make it individual to the client. Um, now on the single leg stuff. So you both mentioned that you really love the single leg stuff. Why is single leg work so important? You've also, you've already touched on it. Um, so we're talking single leg work, like your Bulgarians, um, your split squats, your lunges, and also looking at doing single leg knee extensions rather than double. Everything you do as a human, you do on one leg at a time. Exactly. Running is a series of hops. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, even double leg jumping in things like volleyball, you know, the way they take off, it's, 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 you need each leg to be independently strong to be a human and an athlete. Walking up and down stairs, we do everything one leg at a time. Jill? You will, you will avoid loading any structure that doesn't want to be loaded if you give people options to do it. Two-legged stuff gives you options to take the load off the affected muscle, tendon, joint, whatever you want to do it. Same as multi-joint stuff gives you that option. So if you do a double leg squat, your affected tendon, muscle tendon unit will avoid it. You know, you, you know that for yourself. So you've just got to keep going backwards until you get the load on the structure you want until it's actually... And, and Ebbs might be able to talk about the brain here, but we get massive inhibition, as you know, from Ebbs's fabulous work for that muscle that's attached to the affected tendon. So if you give it a chance to unload, it will do it. And by loading it, you actually potentially have the effect on the inhibition and then you can build it back into the kinetic chain. Anything to add there, Ebony? Um, yep. So there's really good evidence from a brain and sort of um, the way the brain controls the drive to the muscle that unilateral exercise is really, really important for that inhibition that Jill spoke about. So I can go into a really nerdy answer, but yeah, I won't. Go, I go into the nerdy stuff. Like, and can we talk about, because I wanted to talk about how you use the analogy of the accelerator and the brake and how you use the metronome and all that sort of stuff. Like, let's dive into that right sure. now. Sure. Yep. So um, everything we do is controlled through uh, different um, communication in our brain and in particular one main region called our motor cortex and our motor cortex all of our movements are represented our muscles aren't it's actually a movement representation and from that little region of your brain it controls uh, a movement and it does so like the accelerator and the brake of a car so you can think of the accelerator as being your your excitability okay it's like the on and then you can think of your break is the inhibition and everything is a balance between those two things regardless of whether or not it's fine motor or gross motor we're balancing our brake and our accelerator and it's predominantly driven from that motor cortex what we've seen in people with um patella tendinopathy and we've also these some other research in the elbow and the rotator cuff now that shows that people with tendinopathy have changes to the way their brake and accelerator works. It's quite a different profile of motor, motor drive. And 
our traditional rehabilitation, um, including strength training, doesn't actually address the motor drive. You'll get stronger in your muscle. You'll get changes in tendon stiffness that Jill spoke about. You'll get really, really important physiological changes, but it doesn't change the brake in the accelerator. And that could be one of the contributors as to why tendon pain is um, really recalcitrant to treatment. It can come back. We can see it on the other side. It can be one of the reasons why it's, it's a real challenge clinically. So um, does that make sense with the braking the accelerator, Andrew? Yeah, exactly. Really well answered. Yep. Continue if you've got more to add. Yep. So the metronome is one method that's been used in the neuroscience literature to essentially make our strength exercise like a skill. So what I mean by that is if you just sit on the leg extension machine and you just go through the motions, as I said, you'll get stronger. But if we pair that with an external um, beat, then you're actually not responding to that beat. You're actually anticipating it. Your brain waves change, different interneurons in your brain connect. And your brain has to really plan. It has to make that movement quite skilled. If you tell me I've got three seconds to do a concentric and four seconds to do an eccentric, I actually have to plan and I have to use my frontal lobe. I have to use a number of different parts of my brain to make that a skill. And the effect of that is that we're able to change our brake and our accelerator. It's not the only technique, but it's a it's a simple one that we can pair with load because it's important when we're thinking about the brain that we don't swing the pendulum so far the other way and think, oh, we've just got to do deal with the brain. We actually need capacity in the body as well. Jill, have you got anything to add there? And really well answered, Ebony. That was amazing. No, nothing to add. Great. And in regards to using the metronome, do you use the metronome for a vast majority of your clients or is it only in a small proportion of people that you use it? Yeah, it's a good question. I tend to use it for, um, I tend to use it specifically for that muscle, the affected muscle tendon. So um, I don't make them listen to the metronome for every one of their exercises because I think that's awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, can, I can attest to that. I tried the whole metronome <laughs> thing and I hated it. <laughs> so I, I'll negotiate, you know, I might yeah. do the leg extension, but then they can listen to music for, you know, everything else. Cause the best exercise is the one that gets done. So um, it's about finding a balance for adherence as well. But for the person that's going to quick with their exercise, it can be a nice way to actually guarantee your time under tension. Um, it also augments uh, cross education. So I would get someone to do it. So just say you've got, I think you said you had right-sided um, patellar tendinopathy, Andrew. I'd get you to do it on each side because you'll get cross-education and you'll get um, more improved cross-education doing it. Anything to add, Jill? Yeah, one of the things that you see people do is their heavy slow resistance far too fast. And it's a really good way of making them slow down. It gets fabulous brain stuff, as Ev's talked about. But we, I see too many people using way too much of their elastic component to get through their exercise as quick as possible. You know, I've got five minutes to get to the gym. I don't know, fling a flu and then get out. The answer is that's not really helpful, especially in the early stages of our heavy slow resistance. Quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just, again, it's so much, it's, it's often a time restraint mm. that people have more than, than that. And, you know, having to get out to get to pick up the kids from school and just going through the motions rather than paying attention, it slows you down, it makes you pay attention to your task and um, it, it can make a difference. Now, Ebony, I've seen you on, I think, the Learn Physio Instagram uh, discuss the Achilles peritendon versus the mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. Can you dive into the difference and how it's going to present differently and also what you're going to do in terms of treatment? I Go feel very it. passionately about this. I can tell. I, I can <laughs> tell when you when you see I've you. On, <laughs> she's ready. Go. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So the critical thing and we haven't actually defined it in this podcast but the criti critical thing that I've learned from Jill is you have to understand tendon load so you have to understand 
the load that the tendon is seeing. So very, very simply, if we think about a load that will provoke our mid portion, we're talking about loads where we're asking our tendon to store and release energy like a spring in the Achilles, okay? So that can be, you know, running, but even as we get older, we need to use our Achilles tendon like a spring to step off a curb, to walk down stairs. So we, we use our Achilles tendon like a spring throughout our lifespan, which is why we can see such a heterogeneous group of people with Achilles tendon issues, unlike the patella tendon, which is our little unicorn, a very specific subgroup of anterior knee pain. But if we think about the loads that are going to provoke the peritendon, and just to remind people, the peritendon is the outside sort of sheath that slides and glides over the, the tendon itself. The loads that will provoke the peritendon are lots and lots of movement, but not necessarily energy storage. So some clinical examples, Andrew, would be things like cycling, where people are going through repeated plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, the rowing machine, um, swimming. So they're getting lots and lots and lots of movement, but they're not using their tendon like a spring. So that's what we want to listen out for clinically as a differentiator. Where I see clinicians get caught up is not listening to tendon pain behavior. So we said before about tendons warming up, this is so helpful to differentiate a mid portion tendinopathy from a peritendon. If you have someone with tendinopathy, they often feel stiff and sore at the start of an activity and it warms up, but they're worse 24 hours later. If you have someone with a peritendon condition, the behavior can be very different. You might have someone that is a runner and you think, oh, well, that's, that's tensile load, that's energy storage load. It must be mid portion. You must ask about tendon pain behavior because if your runner says to you, actually, it gets worse the longer I go, or you read papers where they say, oh, we had to, you know, this person didn't have pain until they were five kilometers into a run. It's not tendinopathy. What's happening with that person is as they fatigue and their calf gets tired, they start to go through bigger ranges of motion and they start to provoke the peritendon. So we are interested in um, diagnosis about pain location, mid portion, very, very focal under load, provoked by our energy storage load. Peritendons can be much more diffuse. They're provoked by movement loads. So the history is critical. Tendons that uh, warm up, more likely to be tendinopathy. Ones that get worse the longer you go, far more likely to be a peritendon condition. In the assessment, um, there are clear differences in how they present. And um, Jill, I'll let you talk about that. The final little tip I'll give you for a peritendon is you can actually put a stethoscope over the tendon, you get, get them to plantar flex and dorsiflex and you can hear the crepitus. The critical reason why you differentiate these is your management. If my peritendon is provoked by movement loads, am I gonna give this person calf raises? I hope not, but I hope that you would give calf raises someone with mid portion tendinopathy. So it's a completely different management and that's why it matters. Jill. Yeah, um, so differential diagnosis has to be a passion of both Ebs, Ebs and I because when we run our desperate and dateless clinic, which are people with long-term tendon pain that are not getting better, it's interesting, it's differential diagnosis that comes out again and again and again as the reason that these people are not getting better. People are not discriminating tendinopathy from other sources of pain. And, you know, for, for anterior knee pain, 95% of them are patellofemoral and 5% of them are tendon. Um, and for Achilles, probably 50-50. People who've had long-term tendinopathy and had treatment, it's about being specific about the diagnosis. And as Eb said, just to talk about how they present, you know, they, they have a very different history as she talked about. But what we see in a tendinopathy is this load-dependent increase in pain. So two-legged slow will be less sore than one-legged slow, which will be less sore than two-legged fast, which will be less sore than one-legged fast, so hopping, um, which will be less than a big hop. So you get, as you increase the load on the tendon itself by increasing the rate of loading, their pain tends to go up. In our peritendons, it's all over the place. They can be quite sore with very low loads and not as sore with high loads or it can be the same the whole way through. 
Um, and so it, it, you're just not seeing that load dependent increase in pain and put that together with the fact that it's often not localized, it, it tends to be distributed more. Those are the two things that make us say this is a tendon. Localized pain stays localized with load and a load dependent increase in pain. Now, peritendon doesn't fit that. So whether you call it a tendon related condition it still needs to be discriminated from a true tendon um, tendinopathy. Could you often see a peritendon issue with someone that's been doing a lot of calf raises off the edge of a step? If say, for instance, they're a bodybuilder or something like that, Ebony? If their technique's poor, especially because they actually bounce, um, yeah, and get a lot of a lot of shear and friction. So, yep, yeah, you can. Jill, can I can I just add one more thing? Um, in in patel in anterior knee pain, we tend to see either tendon or patellofemoral pain, yep. and it doesn't tend to mix. And that's a that's really poor clinical practice if you say, oh, it's a bit of this and a bit of that. It just doesn't happen. It's either one or the other. But all our other tendons can be a bit of everything. So you can have a little bit of tendinopathy and some peritendon issues. So if you don't have capacity to run, you can actually irritate both structures by increasing too much load on the tendon, but also starting to go through a bigger range of motion and, and have a peritendon. So you need to be addressing both of those issues and you work, need to work out which one is the main source of your pain. But you have to treat the peritendon before you can treat the tendon. Um, because that's an easy gain. You'll get, get that under control relatively quickly in inverted commas. So it can you can get a mix and match um, where some of your pain is from the tendon and some is from some neural structures and or peritendon, whereas in the anterior knee, it's one or the other. It's like an Achilles, it's like an Achilles with the lot. Absolutely. <laughs> um, now, in regards to shoes, so say, for instance, someone comes in and they've got an Achilles issue, whether it be a peritendon or an Achilles tendinopathy mid-portion, would you get them to go into a bigger drop in terms of the shoe height, in terms of the heel? What are your thoughts on adding heel lift? Ebs, do you want to have a go? Sure. So if we're talking about the peritendon, um, then footwear is really important because if someone is in a shoe with a big heel they won't go through as much range of motion even just walking around so there'll be less peritendon irritation so it's actually a really important strategy for us for settling them down um, the mid portion doesn't care about a heel lift because it's uh the the insertion does because the insertion doesn't want to be in compression walking around and getting into dorsiflexion but it's not an it's not a um helpful intervention for the mid portion just one more thing to add is we don't go, we don't put things inside the shoe, Andrew, because you know how the heel counter of most shoes are sort of angled. If you chalk up those little red heel raises that people like to stick together, all you do is push someone out of the shoe and you yeah. can irritate the superficial bursa on the back of the, the <coughs> heel. So we would uh, get them to go to a boot maker and wedge a pair of shoes or you know, wear some shoes that already have an external heel, but we don't stick things inside their shoe. But peritendon, very important, mid-portion, less so for me. Jill? Yeah, it's about changing load. So if you are just uh, walking the dog, your shoe changes are not so important. But if you are a 50, 60, 70 kilometre a week runner, then a simple change in shoes can actually change load on tendon and can provoke the tendon not the, um, And, you know, some of these um, cushiony type shoes often have a, a big sort of drop. And if you've gone from a more traditional shoe to one of those, you'll find that it can aggravate your insertion, it can aggravate your mid, mid Achilles. And it's about the combination of the change in your position when you run and the amount of volume that you're doing. So if you do a low volume, you can do just about anything, but shoe change can be quite important. Um, um, and just as a, a side, these new carbon fiber insoles, you know, most people are really enjoying those who have foot and or Achilles inju injuries or, or Achilles pain. Um, and it seems that some of the energy that you use when run is coming from the shoe. So it actually decreases the load on the Achilles. Now that, can be really positive for somebody who's sort of struggling with an Achilles, but you also need to make sure that you don't rely on the shoe too much. You actually have to make sure the capacity in your muscle tendon is good as well. 
Yeah, they're getting a lot of press at the moment because of the Olympics, the super shoes. Have you actually tried them? They're amazing. I have a pair and I just am wholly in love with them. They're basically. amazing. I, I can't get over how good they are. It's like a, it's like you're running with springs. Yeah, exactly. I feel like um, Roger Rabbit. I feel like I can, yeah. I can just, you know, I feel like I want to run in them. Whereas yeah. a normal pair of shoes, I feel like, oh, God, do I have to run? Whereas those make you feel like you've got something underneath you, almost like, you know, the Jetsons where you have those little, you know, um, rockets under your feet. They're, they are amazing. Um, just a caveat, they're very expensive and they don't have a long life. So um, you have to really be passionate about your running. Or I think for people with foot problems, I think taking aside the Achilles, I think they're really fabulous for the Achilles. Not so good for the insertion because they've, they've got a drop. Um, so you have to be careful from that perspective. But if you've got midfoot problems, you know, a bit of um, tussle arthritis, um, even some um, big toe arthritis, they can be fabulous because they take away all of that movement through there and, and give you something back. But again, you know, you could argue you need to supplement that with some intrinsic muscle function because it'll be taking away that um, as well. Ebony, have you tried them? No, I haven't tried them, but I might have to invest. You guys are talking them up. Yeah, well, you, you even look at the the times of the Olympics at the moment, the 400 metre hurdles in the women's and the men's got broken and it got smashed, you know, like mm. they absolutely destroyed it. And they're talking that the track's quick and it's warm over there, but the shoe, the super shoes are obviously having an influence and Kipchoge broke the world record in the, the marathon, well, the unofficial world record in the marathon with them on. And that's when they started to get all the press and Usain Bolt's come out and said that he disagrees with it but i'm all for it if everyone's got access to it go for it i think it's good it might be like the suits in swimming they might <laughs> run it back yeah. a bit mm. i think Very... they already are oh yeah okay mm. there, there, yeah. there's talk yeah for sure i i think it's kind of a good thing in a way but there needs to be a point where they pull things back you know you can't make it too super no it, it comes down to accessibility it, it's it's no good if it's accessible to wealthy countries and not to poorer countries and exactly. that's often the way in the olympics um you might find that if they made it available to everybody then it probably doesn't matter as much yeah last question i know i've taken up a lot of your time already prp is it effective you both said no for a tendinopathy why oh, well, do you, do you not, want to go first <laughs> oh yes please let me um i'm the pathology nut basically um it, nothing changes pathology why why would we Think that sticking something in a pathology is going to change either the tendon structure, the cell function, the cell abnormality, or the slowed sensitivity. I, I, you know, do they have healing, you know, properties? Pretty much no. Um, there's not a single decent paper that shows that there's benefit from it. Doesn't really matter what tendon you use. Um, so, you know, from a science perspective of what's actually happening in the tendon, absolutely no evidence that that's going to be um, uh, effective from a clinical outcome, no evidence that it's effective. Um, what it does is offer um, uh, medicos usually uh, uh, something to offer the patient. And, and I understand that if somebody's got long-term tendon pain, they want something done, then often there's a desire to offer something and this is PRP is often what it is. You know, there's stem cells and all sorts of other things as well. And I understand that as long as you tell the patient, the athlete, what your outcome is likely to be. There is no evidence that this will change your tendon structure. There is no evidence that this will make you better clinically. There is evidence for exercise interventions, your choice. And if the patient then says, yes, I want it, I, you know, knock yourself out but um if you what annoys me is it's being presented as an, a reasonable option and that's just not true so i think it's about making sure that we um listen to our patients about what's important to them and what's important to people is their pain their function and you know i'd be keen to add a third in and around the motor drive not necessarily because patients 
have that on their radar, but just the complexity and the challenge of treating tendons means I think that, you know, it should be something that's on our radar. But even if we just go with pain and function, PRP doesn't target either of those. So that's the first thing. And that's what Jill was saying about it not having a clinical improvement. It's because it's directed at structure. It, for me, it creates an ongoing narrative that I need to fix you. It's the opposite of, of our empowerment and the biopsychosocial model that we're talking about in the education you know exercise is the most efficacious treatment but it's also incredibly important for self-efficacy you know it's something that that person can do as opposed to I need to do this treatment to fix your structure which is not only incorrect um, it creates a negative and unhelpful narrative around um, around the condition yeah, really well answered. Anything to add there, Jill? No, I think it just is a perfect example of how complex this is. This idea that tendinopathy is easy and that you just, just do this or you just do that um, is, is just flawed. It's about the person, we always said, treat the person in front of you. And that can be anybody from an 80-year-old with a glute tendon to an Olympic sprinter. Why on earth do we think that, that is a simplistic there's a simplistic way to deal with those two extremes. For sure. Thank you so much for both coming on. Now, a lot of physio students and new grad physios listen to this podcast. I'll give you both a couple of minutes to give out any advice you've got for them. Some uh, golden nuggets of wisdom. Go for it. Jill. Oh, gosh. For their careers, do you mean? Yeah, like careers or even just okay. you can give some um you know, some okay. golden nuggets Good. of tendon, yeah. tendon right. pain. Right. Okay. Here's my golden nugget. That's just my passion at the moment. Get in the gym yourself. Yes. Because you can't, you, you, we see people trying to prescribe load when they actually don't know what it feels like to experience load. They don't understand progressions. They don't understand what it feels like to do 20 reps versus five reps. How can you prescribe load without actually knowing how it feels to be yourself? So there's my golden nugget. You can't be a good musculoskeletal physiotherapist until you fully understand rehabilitation from TheraBand, which we would never use, up to being able to do squats and leg extensions and all of the things that we talk about and, and understanding how the metronome works. Get in the gym. Vinny. Physio is such a fabulous profession and if you're not liking it and I'm directing this at our new grads because unfortunately the attrition rate from physio is too high we lose too many fabulous young talented smart people to other professions if you are not liking physio change your job not your career there's so many um, avenues for physio and different options that you know if you've if you're not in a good workplace, then consider getting out of that rather than leaving physio. I just want to keep more great physios in physio. Great advice. Now for the listeners, where can they find you both in terms of, do you have an Instagram? Do I'm have... inside my home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm locked down in I'm, Melbourne. I'm under my bed. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a profile. I choose not to have yeah. a profile. If you're desperate, I can be accessed on email at Latrobe, but I have caveats around that because I get emails that say, could you send me all the papers on Achilles tendinopathy, please? You know, no is the answer to that. So if you have a specific question and not a case study, I've got a lady with an XD Whitey million, you know, three-page email, no. But, you know, I try to be responsive, if I can, to reasonable um, inputs on my time. Ebony? Yeah, I'm not on Instagram or Twitter or anything. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't be sorry at all. I think it's a good thing. I think Instagram's completely ruined the world in oh, some way. See, some I think way. Twitter is the toilet of the internet. So <laughs> everyone's got their own bias, I guess. Um, I, sorry, Jill. Go sorry, no, I just have a Twitter account and I do answer questions on Twitter. It's lovely because people can't send you free page Twitter. <laughs> Anything Anything else, Ebony? Uh, nope. Yeah, Jill and I do try and get back to people on email. So, yeah, that's fine. 
Cool. This podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, so you can both listen to it back if you like. And I'm going to put it on YouTube and throw you under the bus. Apologies. <laughs> I'd like some more warning next time. Yeah, sorry. I thought I, I, I thought I sent it in the email. Apologies. No, we're just looking like the lockdown people at the moment, you know, completely and utterly unprepared physically for something like this. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time. It's been a wealth of knowledge and I feel like all the listeners will get a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Thank you Pleasure. for having us. Thanks. Thanks very much. See you, everyone. As usual, stay strong.